Hi there, who are you? I'm Jeff Bezos. And what, are your, what is your claim to fame? <laughs> I'm the founder of Amazon.com. Amazon. Most of you know it as the online marketplace where you can buy anything from six foot tall, 150 pound Bigfoot statues to Nicolas Cage pillowcases. Yeah, Amazon sells pretty much everything. In fact, they currently have a selection of over 100 million different products to choose from, and they also shipped about 5 billion items last year alone. That accounts for nearly 40% of everything sold on the internet. But even though Amazon is known by consumers as a company that makes money by selling products online, that actually isn't how Amazon makes money. In fact, Amazon loses money on nearly every single purchase that is made through their website. So how did Amazon make its money? How is it profitable? And how did they become the mammoth of an e-commerce company like they are today? Well, it actually started off with fairly modest beginnings. This is the story of Amazon. Let's take you all the way back to the 1990s when the top fads were Beanie Babies, Tamagotchis, and yes, the internet. Allison, can you explain what internet is? It's a giant computer network. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a in computer the dictionary. billboard. It is true that when I was a kid, the information superhighway, as we called it, was an unknown but growing sector of the economy. <laughs> Actually, the term growing may be a little bit of an understatement in this case because the growth of e-commerce in 1994 was nearly 2,300%. A young Wall Street executive named Jeff Bezos had been paying attention to the growth of the internet and decided to leave his Wall Street firm in order to start an e-commerce company. He did this because he had something which he called a regret minimization framework, which meant that he never wanted to wake up one day when he was 70 years old and regret not trying to start a business with a massive growth opportunity like the internet. So Mr. Bezos packed up, moved to Seattle, and began to work on a business plan for his new e-commerce company, which he called Cadabra Inc. Not what you were expecting, I'm guessing. He then went to legally incorporate the company, Cadabra Inc., except that his lawyer misheard the company name and incorporated it as Cadaver Inc., which was a little bit too dark for Bezos' liking, so he came up with another name, Relentless. Again, I'm guessing that's not what you were expecting. Bezos purchased Relentless.com in September of 1994, but after his friends told him that it sounded too sinister, he ended up settling on... Amazon.com. One little side note or fun fact here is that if you were to type in relentless.com into your address bar or into Google, you'll find that it redirects you to Amazon.com. So the next thing Bezos did was he created a list of 20 categories of products that could be sold on his website. And he specifically wanted a wide variety of products to exist within each one of those categories. He then narrowed it down to five categories. They were compact discs, computer hardware, computer software, videos, and books. Eventually, he decided to focus in on books due to the high demand of books, the large amounts of titles available, and the low price point. Within two months of launching Amazon.com, the company had sold books in 45 countries and was making over $80,000 per month. Little did they know that within 25 years, Amazon would soon be making $80,000 every 14 seconds. Revenue for Amazon continued to grow over the next couple years, so they decided to go public in 1996 and they were listed on the NASDAQ. Amazon stock IPO'd at the equivalent of $1.50 price per share. And when you look at Amazon stock price today, which is a cool $1,500, you can do the math and calculate that if you invested $10,000 in Amazon's IPO in 1996, it would be worth roughly $10 million today. However, Amazon would hit a few rough patches over the next few years. Barnes & Noble sued Amazon in 1997, alleging that Amazon's claim to be the world's largest bookstore was false because it isn't a bookstore at all, it's a book broker. The suit was settled out of court, and Amazon continued to call itself the world's largest bookstore. Amazon was then sued again by Walmart in 1998, alleging that Amazon stole some of Walmart's secrets by hiring former Walmart executives. The suit was also settled 
out of court. Despite these lawsuits, Amazon continued to grow at a tremendous rate by mainly selling books. But selling just books was not good enough for Jeff Bezos. So later in 1998, the company made a big decision to expand beyond books and started selling a little bit of everything. This was the first step that Amazon took towards becoming the everything store. The decision to start selling everything made Amazon's revenue jump to nearly $1 billion, cementing itself as one of the giants of the e-commerce industry. Investors soon became very fond of Amazon and its upside potential, which made Amazon's stock price reach $113 per share in 1999 and indirectly making Jeff Bezos a billionaire and Time's Person of the Year. It very much seemed like nothing could go wrong for Amazon. However, Amazon was amongst many other tech companies that seemed to be going through a golden age of tech sector investing within the stock market. But this was the exact opposite of a golden age. At the time, investors thought investing in new tech startups with zero profit and very little revenue was a fantastic idea. In fact, most investors didn't even know much about what they were investing in. They just heard about the crazy returns that these tech investments were getting, so they just decided to go with the flow and gamble with their money without knowing much about how they were getting their returns. Luckily today, we don't have anything like that out there, so don't worry about this. This senseless investing in the late 90s from Wall Street caused a massive tech bubble or dot-com bubble in the stock market. For proof of how crazy some of these tech investments were, here are some companies that were valued at near or over $1 billion at the time with little to no revenue. Broadcast.com, Geocities, TheGlobe.com, Healthion, Inktomi, Actua, VerticalNet, ThinkTools, InfoSeek, Global Crossing, Commerce One, and there are actually tons of other ones, but covering all of the billion dollar tech companies that went bust during the tech bubble would take all day. So how does this relate to Amazon? Well, after investors came to their senses and realized that companies that don't have a product yet shouldn't be worth $2 billion, they decided to pull their money out of the overvalued tech sector. This caused Amazon's stock price to fall from $113 at its high to $5.51 at its low. That's a 95% drop. This may not seem like it should mean much to a company because the stock price has very little to do with the day-to-day -day operations of a company, even dramatic swings like that. But it does certainly affect a company's access to capital and financing, which are usually vital for startup tech companies like Amazon. Needless to say, most young tech companies did not survive the tech bubble bursting. However, eBay, Priceline, SanDisk, Shutterfly, and Amazon were some of the few that managed to make it out alive. Over the next few years, Amazon would start making very modest profits. Nothing too special, but they weren't growing as fast and they became somewhat stagnant as a company. So they had to try something else. In 2005, they thought, what if we offered free two-day shipping within the United States on select products? They called this Amazon Prime. However, this was the second most important move that Amazon would make in 2005, but we will come back to that in a second. The move to give free two-day shipping on a lot of products would actually make the company lose money on every single product that was shipped due to the increased cost of this fast shipping. And to this day in 2018, Amazon still loses money on every single product that is sold on their website. So how does Amazon make a profit? IMDB, Audible, Zappos, Twitch, Whole Foods, what do these companies have in common? Well, all of these companies are worth over a billion dollars and all are owned by Amazon. Even though these subsidiary companies do not affect Amazon's bottom line that much in terms of revenue, what I wanted to show you is that a lot of giant companies have a business strategy where their main product or service is not profitable like Amazon's marketplace, but several of their smaller subsidiaries products or services are profitable. So let's bring this back. Remember when I said that Amazon Prime was the second biggest decision that Amazon made in 2005? Well, that's because the biggest decision, at least in my opinion, was starting a subsidiary company called Amazon Web Services, or AWS for short. 
AWS does a ton of different things, but to try and simplify it, AWS is a cloud computing company that hosts websites and applications for customers and other businesses. For example, let's say you have a great new business idea, Tinder, but for dogs. Let's call it Dogger. In order for you to build Dogger and have it be connected to the internet, you will need to put it on a server. There are plenty of companies that will cut corners and let you host a personal blog on part of a server for about $4.95 a month. But if you want to build a big company, you will likely need one to 10 full servers to start. And each one of these will cost you between $2,000 and $5,000 a piece. And for a lot of small businesses that are just starting out, that can be really unaffordable. So. AWS lets you rent out servers based on your needs, and the price is variable depending on your usage, but it usually ends up being around $500 to $1,000 per year depending on your company. That's much more reasonable for a startup like Dogger. So to summarize what AWS does is they offer a very affordable way for businesses to host large scale websites. This would become very vital to Amazon in the future. In fact, over the next 13 years, AWS would end up growing at a rate faster than Amazon Marketplace. Roughly 34% of all websites today use Amazon Web Services as a platform. Meanwhile, the next three biggest competitors, Microsoft, Google, and IBM, own 11%, 8%, and 6% of that share respectively. So how important is AWS to Amazon as a whole? Well, let's break down their financial information. Amazon Marketplace made $160 billion in revenue last year, but had a loss of $200 million, largely because of the shipping costs. This means that they had a loss margin of 0.125%, which also means that on every single product that is sold through their website, Amazon loses, on average, 0.125%. That doesn't sound like a great business strategy to me. Step in, Amazon Web Services. AWS made $17.5 billion in revenue last year, 4.3 billion of which was profit, meaning that AWS has a profit margin of 24.5%. So even though AWS makes up only 9.8% of Amazon's revenue, it makes up nearly 100% of Amazon's profit and cancels out any losses that Amazon Marketplace may acquire from expanding its control over online shipping using Amazon Prime. And I cannot stress the importance of this enough because AWS gave Amazon Marketplace the ability to take losses on all of its transactions while expanding Amazon Prime to what we know it is today. This allowed Amazon to really leave other e-commerce competitors like eBay in the dust. However, while Amazon was on the path to becoming this e-commerce giant, it also had some downsides along the way. For example, Amazon has gotten in trouble for allegedly not paying taxes and for having an anti-competitive advantage over other storefront businesses because Amazon was not really forced to pay sales tax up until 2011. They have also gotten in trouble many times for allegedly having poor working conditions. One time in 2011, warehouse workers in Pennsylvania had to carry out work in 38 degrees Celsius heat, which allegedly made some employees suffer from dehydration and even faint. This was allegedly because loading bay doors were not allowed to be open to allow fresh air inside the warehouse because of Amazon's concerns over theft. So what did Amazon do? They paid for an ambulance to sit outside on call to cart away any overheated employees. The company eventually installed air conditioning at this warehouse. Another gripe with Amazon comes from businesses that sell on Amazon. Half of Amazon Marketplace is populated by small business owners and people who make a living off of selling things online. You may have actually heard me talking about why you should sell things on Amazon in past videos. However, in the past few years, when Amazon sees that a product is selling well on their website, they make their own version of that product and undercut the original seller and rank their product ahead of the small business owner that originally posted the product. This has made small business owners unable to compete on Amazon's website and lose an essential portion of their income. But what if you could sell your products online without having too much competition from a big monopoly company like Amazon? 
Or what if you could buy a product online and have it shipped to you in two days without needing to spend a hundred bucks on Amazon Prime? Well, Joysk.com is a new startup marketplace that I'm currently building. It is still in the alpha testing stage and free two day shipping is only being tested in a few cities in Canada at the moment. But if you want to support this channel, I would really appreciate if you'd go on to Joysk.com, just check it out, maybe buy something if you'd like or start selling something and maybe make some cash yourself. Or you can just buy a cheap product and, you know, resell it on Amazon or eBay for all I care or resell it on Joysk. It's totally up to you. Honestly, uh, there are still a lot of kinks to work out in this website, so it's still in the testing stage, and I'm, I'm not marketing this site like crazy right now, but it would mean a lot to me if you'd go on there, at least check it out, let me know what you think. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. Uh, you're all very beautiful people. Please subscribe if you like this video and hit that like button, and I'll see you guys next time.